I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare. Series 1, Chapter 7, Why All the Footnotes, Shakespeare's Mental Furniture. Session 5, Decorum, Realism in Morality Plays, and Foreground is Background. Imagine a Superman or a Spider-Man or Batman movie in which the hero dies after the intermission and there's no sequel. Imagine an automobile commercial on TV that showed the advertised car dusty in normal city traffic instead of squeaky clean on the open highways of Utah. Imagine a TV show featuring a soccer mom without an SUV, or a construction worker having quiche for lunch, or a corporate executive who values virtue more than the bottom line. Hard to do except as a joke? This is because, often without realizing it, we have very specific expectations of our popular entertainments. And when a movie or TV show inadvertently goes too far against those expectations, it loses its audience. The intentional breaking of our expectations is another matter, as we'll see in the podcast on the nature of art in chapter 15. All ages have such expectations of art, but the content of those expectations changes with time and place. In Shakespeare's time and place, such expectations were elaborate and explicit. People spoke and wrote about what was fitting or unfitting for any particular kind of entertainment. This principle the Renaissance called decorum. Decorum, or the doctrine of appropriateness, as Professor Madeline Doran describes in her book Endeavors of Art, was for Shakespeare and his audience a fundamental value in every realm of human life. In his Art of English Poesy, the Elizabethan writer George Putnam, spelled P-U-T-T-E-N-H-A-M, writes, There is a decency to be observed in every man's action and behavior as well as in his speech and writing and this decency of man's behavior as well as of his speech must also be deemed by discretion, in which regard the thing that may well become one man to do may not become another, and which is seemly to be done in this place is not so seemly in that, and at such a time decent, but another time undecent, and in such a case and for such a purpose, and to this and that end." Professor Doran adds, Speech and behavior must be appropriate to the person, the place, the time, the circumstance, the end or purpose. The lore of decorum was abundant in Shakespeare's time in such forms as the four or seven ages of man, the four humors or temperaments, the differences in the sexes, the trades, the social classes, the characteristics of different nationalities, and so on. As we've seen, we too engage in generalizing expectations, which we might call stereotyping. But, as Professor Doran says, the Renaissance distinctions were more detailed and formalized than with us, and were brought home more sharply in the visible signs of color, dress, insignia, and ceremony, both public and private. Every Renaissance man must have absorbed these things as a commonplace background to his own judgments about people, and everything he learned in school or read in critical theory, if he concerned himself with that, would have confirmed the habit of identifying class, meaning classification of whatever kind, by signs. On the subject of the ages of man, Jacus in As You Like It gives a set speech at Act 2, Scene 7, Line 139 and following, famously beginning, All the World's a Stage. Shakespeare lends his particular magic to the details of the speech by the melancholy Jacus, but the concept of the ages of man was a standard one. Each person's attitude and behavior corresponded more or less to his or her chronological age. That the stage was a mirror of the world was also a commonplace. Shakespeare's own theater was called the Globe, and its motto was Totus Mundus Agit Histrionem, meaning the whole world, that is, everyone, plays the actor. The world was a macrocosm of the stage, and the stage was a microcosm of the world. 
Tied to this idea was the expectation that the characters and situations played on the stage must be representative of what is generally true. To Shakespeare's audience, if a character were not representative of a type, it could be neither significant nor believable. Quirky particularity was either a sign of an underlying type in disguise, to be revealed later, or unbelievable. Only the universal was really true. In practice, this meant decorum. What people took for convincing portraits on stage had to fit, or at least acknowledge, their expectations. As Hamlet says to the players at Act 3, Scene 2, Line 17 to 18, let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action. Of course, Shakespeare is not simply a maker of type characters. The trick was to bring the type alive, to give it particular authenticity, freshness, vitality, and so he did. But we don't have much trouble seeing the individuality and vitality of Shakespeare's characters. What is more difficult for us is to see how much those characters also adhere to Renaissance types that we no longer have in mind. Look at Portia's satirical list of the qualities of her suitors in The Merchant of Venice in Act I, Scene Two, The Neapolitan cares only about horses. The county palatine is melancholic. The Frenchman is all changeable surface and no substance. The Scotsman is choleric. The German is a drunk. Among the others, Portia makes fun of an Englishman, at lines 69 to 76, challenging the audience to laugh at themselves. He hath neither Latin, French, nor Italian. He is a proper man's picture, but alas, who can converse with a dumb show? How oddly he is suited! I think he bought his doublet in Italy, his round hose in France, his bonnet in Germany, and his behavior everywhere. This would not be so funny if it didn't fit what the audience knew to be true of the typical Englishman abroad. When Hamlet at Act 1, Scene 2, Line 146 says, Frailty, thy name is woman, he is not being guilty of misogyny. Rather, he always thought his mother was of the virtuous woman type, the kind of woman who will die rather than compromise her own chastity or any other virtue. Examples of that type include Isabel in Measure for Measure, Helena in All's Well That Ends Well, Cordelia in King Lear, and most of the heroines of the late romances, strong, faithful, determined women whose commitment to virtuous love no male argument can derail. Now Hamlet is forced to recognize with pain that Gertrude, his mother, is of the other type of woman, the frail type, whose receptive nature cannot stand up against intense masculine persuasion. Other members of that category are Hamlet's beloved Ophelia, who is not unchaste, but who succumbs to the arguments of her brother and the commands of her father in turning away from Hamlet, Cressida in Troilus and Cressida, and Lady Anne in Richard III. Even women who do not collapse under pressure are aware of the danger of doing so. In Twelfth Night, Act 2, Scene 2, Lines 29 to 32, Viola observes, How easy is it for the proper false in women's waxen hearts to set their forms. Alas, our frailty is the cause, not we. For such as we are made of, such we be. And in Measure for Measure, at Act 3, Scene 4, Lines 127 to 130, Isabel says, Women, help heaven! Nay, call us ten times frail, for we are soft as our complexions are, and credulous to false prints. This identification of women with softness is a shared commonplace of the age. For a female character to assert otherwise would be to discredit herself, as Lady Macbeth does when, at Act 1, Scene 5, Line 40 and following, she asks the evil spirits to unsex her, meaning to remove her feminine softness and compassion and to make her hard, cruel, and remorseless. Yet another type of woman is the quick-witted, inventive, way-ahead-of-men-in-getting-it type. Examples are Portia in The Merchant of Venice, Beatrice in Much Ado About Nothing, 
Viola in Twelfth Night, Rosalind in As You Like It, Paulina in The Winter's Tale, and, in a very particular sense, Cleopatra in Antony and Cleopatra. Among men, there is the prudish or detached type who pretends that his blood is cold and women cannot tempt him, like Benedict in Much Ado About Nothing, or Malvolio in Twelfth Night, or Angelo in Measure for Measure, and who is always riding for a fall. There is the calculating villain, Richard III, Shylock in The Merchant of Venice, Don John in Much Ado About Nothing, Iago in Othello, Edmund in King Lear, Antonio in The Tempest. There is the servile courtly fop, Osric in Hamlet, Oswald in King Lear. And there is the melancholic, Jacus in As You Like It, Don John in Much Ado About Nothing. When Hamlet hears that a troop of actors has arrived in Elsinore, he says, at Act 2, Scene 2, lines 320 to 335, that he will welcome them as follows. He that plays the king shall be welcome. His majesty shall have tribute on thee. The adventurous knight shall use his foil and target. The lover shall not sigh gratis. The humorous man shall end his part in peace. The clown shall make those laugh whose lungs are tickle of the seer. And the lady shall say her mind freely, or the blank verse shall halt for it. Hamlet gives us a standard list of the types of characters that an audience in the country could expect to be portrayed by a small traveling troupe. King, knight, lover, humorous man, like Shylock, Don John, Malvolio, Jacus, and Angelo, clown, and lady, played by a boy, of course. The larger companies in the city, like Shakespeare's, would have a wider variety of types to choose from, but the categories of expectation remain. All these are common types that Shakespeare incarnates into particular characters who are, to his audience, believable both for their unique vitality and for their representation of their type. Not only did characters have to fit decorum in age and type, speech itself had to have decorum. For Shakespeare's audience, the speech of a dramatic character was believable only if it was the kind of speech that the audience expected to be spoken by a person with the character's age, rank, gender, wealth, profession, nation, friends, and so on. People of higher status in society don't make verbal blunders like those of the low-born Dogberry in Much Ado About Nothing or Elbow in Measure for Measure. Older men, like Polonius in Hamlet, give pithy advice in old wise sayings. They don't, like young men in love, write extravagant rhymed verse in praise of their beloveds, as Orlando does in As You Like It. As Corin, a shepherd, says to Touchstone, the court fool in As You Like It, at Act 3, Scene 2, lines 45 to 51, those that are good manners at the court are as ridiculous in the country as the behavior of the country is most mockable at the court. You told me you salute not at the court, but you kiss your hands. That courtesy would be uncleanly if courtiers were shepherds. The same is true for language. Throughout his work, Shakespeare draws particularities of individual speech out of characters who are also speaking consistently with their type, or who's not doing so is for a good reason. If a country bumpkin spoke in blank verse or the royal plural, it would be a sure sign that he was either pretentious or mad. Dogberry, in Much Ado About Nothing, comically uses words too big for him. And in Act Two, Scene Four of Henry the Fourth, Part One, when Prince Hal wants to disguise his nobility in the cloak of a commoner, he makes an effort to learn from the tavern waiters that they call drinking deep, dying scarlet, and strives to become so good a proficient that I can drink with any tinker in his own language during my life. He then makes a wonderful joke that again depends on reversing decorum. He says to Poins, Thou hast lost much honor that thou wert not with me in this action. Using the words honor and action, meaning military exploit, usually applied to the nobility, ironically about his winning the approval of the commoners by drinking with them. 
compare this with his real mission, which is to win the loyalty of the nobility, and you see how Shakespeare can use decorum and its reversal to help convey his meaning. The main thing for us to realize is this. For Shakespeare and his audience, decorum in characters and language was not a form of confinement, but a path toward truth. Just as the lines and net of a tennis court can find the players only to make the game meaningful, or the sonnet, by limiting the poet to a given form, liberates his imagination, as we will see in the podcast of chapter 11 on sonnets, so character type and style of speech in the Renaissance were vehicles of meaning, which could be either static and predictable or scintillating with vitality, depending on the gifts of the poet. For Shakespeare, decorum was like language itself. We don't, like Humpty Dumpty, demand that words mean whatever we want them to mean. Only because their meaning is given can we use them to convey our feeling, thought, and experience. For Shakespeare, the same was true of decorum. Only by adhering to it could he bring his characters and situations alive. The better we understand this, the richer and deeper will be our experience of the meaning of his works. Now let's look at one of the ways in which Shakespeare crosses what we think of as a hard line. We tend to think of a play as being either of the realistic kind or of the morality play kind, that is, either specific and particular, a slice of life, or general and moralizing, in a way that applies to all. But when we apply this either-or to Shakespeare, we are bound to be missing something. For example, is Hamlet a realistic drama about a particular man with specific characteristics, one we might know if we lived in the Renaissance? Or is it a morality play generally applicable to all men? The answer is, it is both. We looked at the principle at work here under the topic of universal realism, in the third session of chapter 1. Here, we need only add that Shakespeare was the heir to a tradition extending back to the medieval morality plays, like Every Man, about a man who is told he will die, and forward to our own time, for example, Star Wars, or the Harry Potter novels and movies. A morality play is a play that embodies a moral lesson or insight applicable to everyone. In the early years of the tradition, the names signified the abstract idea being represented. Hence, every man is greeted by death, who tells him he has to go on a journey to God to be judged. Every man wants moral support from people like kin and cousin and friendship and good, meaning worldly goods, and beauty and strength. They all refuse to go with him. Knowledge, meaning of Christian doctrine, goes most of the way with him, but at the last, only the character named Good Deeds accompanies him to death and judgment. The characters are named by the abstractions they represent. In our time, the demands of realism require that we name our hero not Hero, but Luke Skywalker or Harry Potter. Luke doesn't know his father, Harry wears glasses, they have to be utterly specific and realistic in order for us to believe in them while we read the book or watch the movie, and yet the stories are morality tales, trying to be as universally significant as possible. Shakespeare lived in an age and was master of an art that allowed him to make his plays at one and the same time in the same words, characters, settings, and plots, both specific, realistic, believable, and universally significant. To quote my annotated Hamlet, that play is about a man who, like every man, is given a paradoxical assignment to do the right thing in response to a complex situation not of his own making. Hamlet is unique. There is no one in the world or in fiction who is like him. Yet, at the same time, Hamlet is every man. It helps to know that in Twelfth Night, Malvolio's name means bad will. In The Tempest, 
The name of Prospero is a Latin synonym for the Greek word Faustus, so that Shakespeare's good magician is an intentional answer and opposite to Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, as was first pointed out to me by the Jungian analyst James Kirsch. In Henry VI, Part Three, Shakespeare has the following stage direction. Enter a son that hath killed his father at one door, and a father that hath killed his son at another door. Both characters speak personally and eloquently. At the same time, both inescapably and intentionally represent the terrible effects of civil war. As a way of summing up this chapter, let's ask the question, how are we to keep all of this background in our minds as we read or watch a play by Shakespeare? The answer is, we don't need to. Fortunately for us, Shakespeare himself provides us, even without footnotes, a great percentage of the elements of background that we need in order fully to appreciate his plays and poetry. The American poet and scholar J.V. Cunningham said about Shakespeare's plays that in them, foreground is background. All we need to do is to pay attention to all the words of a play. For example, if you want to know what Shakespeare's audience believed about ghosts, said Cunningham, read everything said about ghosts in Hamlet and believe it. In other words, Shakespeare tells us what we need to know to understand Shakespeare. That is because Renaissance writers, like their medieval forebears, enjoyed putting into words everything that mattered to them. They tirelessly found meaning in saying again and again what they knew and believed and what their readers and audiences knew and believed and wanted to be reminded of. Living in a time before newspapers, radio, TV, movies, computers, and smartphones, in a time when printing was a young technology and there were no public libraries, people felt very strongly that words of knowledge and traditional wisdom were both powerful and valuable. As a result, writers felt free to say what people already had heard because they knew the people wanted to hear it again, especially when it was said in interesting, fresh, lively ways. That knowledge provided a context of meaning so audiences and readers knew where they were. Let's take Cunningham's example of the ghost in Hamlet. What can we know of the beliefs of Shakespeare's audience about ghosts based on what is said about the ghost in the play? If we pay attention to Act 1, Scenes 1, 2, 4, and 5, Act 2, Scene 2, and Act 3, Scene 4, we will learn the following. Ghosts appear at or after midnight. They may or may not be merely a fantasy of the mind. They can be called thing, sight, apparition, illusion. They may look like someone who has died. Their appearance may fill even rational men like Horatio with fear and wonder, causing them to tremble and look pale. Rational men might not believe in them until they see them with their own eyes. Ghosts may appear for various reasons, to be helped by the living and thereby eased from some torment, to give warning about future events, to reveal where buried treasure lies, or to report an otherwise hidden crime. They may come, or represent someone as coming, from heaven, or purgatory, or hell, and have good or evil intentions. They may depart when the cock crows and morning comes. They may not dare to appear during the holy season of Christmas. They may be spoken with and may or may not respond. They may be devils in disguise, change shapes, drive men mad, lead them to despair and suicide. Or they may be honest messengers of divine providence revealing otherwise hidden facts and delivering divine assignments. They may appear to one person while at the same time being invisible to another. The fact that the ghost in Hamlet does not reveal his purposes to the watch or even to Horatio is significant. His message is meant for Hamlet only, and we, like the guards, are meant to be wondering what is going on. But when the ghost at last speaks to Hamlet, then we know, when his words later prove to be true, exactly why he has appeared, that is, 
to call the prince to right thought and right action, and we know it because he tells us. His challenge to Hamlet is complex. How can Hamlet enact revenge without tainting his mind? But that is precisely the human problem Shakespeare means to dramatize in the play. If we pay careful attention when reading Shakespeare, we will see that he gives us everything we need to know about the characters and situations in his plays, whether foreground or background, and we will consequently respond accordingly. It is when we ignore large chunks of what the characters are saying that we become confused and begin asking irrelevant questions that the play was not crafted to answer and are tempted to supply answers that distract us from the essential meanings of the play. Meanings that, for all the differences between Shakespeare's worldview and ours, we may find both moving and profoundly valuable. I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare.